This is The Road Show, and I'm your host, David Warren. On today's program, I welcome back Daniel Grothy for part two of our conversation on The Power of Place, a new release from Thomas Nelson Publishers. Let's welcome back Pastor Daniel. Always great to have you. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me today. Well, something unique about your book, The Power of Place, is something that you do right in the middle. And this is going to help out our listeners that did not hear part one of our conversation. You have a section called A Brief Interlude, which kind of summarizes what you wrote about in the first half and what we talked about in part one. So why don't you read this to us as we get going? In section one, we looked at the power of stability in place learned about the ancient vow the saints took, and discovered the God-given purpose of place to give us security, identity, and meaningful work through which we can exercise skilled mastery in God's good world. In section two, we paid attention to the principles of stability in place. We discussed the membership benefits of place, acknowledged that people are the great purifiers, thought through what our skills can do for our particular places, and named the reality that wherever we find ourselves living can be hallowed as holy ground. To purify and provoke our imaginations, we glean from the examples of saints and sages who have lived lives of stability in place. But now in section three, it's time to ask, how do we live out the vow of stability? My contention is that stability is not an abstract concept. Stability is not a spiritual gift that comes naturally to certain people. Stability does not descend from the heavens. Stability is as concrete as our daily routines, as strong as the relationships we pour ourselves into, as deep as the community we become members of, and as stable as the institutions we give ourselves over to. And because of that reality, I'm going to put in front of you five pathways, five holy practices that can play an integral part in the realization of our rootedness in our local places. They are the practices of stability in home, stability in family, stability in friendship, stability in church, and stability in community. These chapters will be succinct and will move quickly. They are meant to throw open the doors and inspire imaginative possibilities about the place you live that you might not have considered yet. Or maybe they will remind you of practices you've engaged in the past that are calling for a fresh recommitment. Pastor Daniel, the first of the practices of stability that you mentioned just now in the intro is the practice of stability in home. Before we talk about making a house or even an apartment a home, let's talk about who initially dwelled in your home as a couple. We've met you, but tell us about your wife, Lisa. How did the two of you meet? Yeah, so I was playing basketball in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, high school, we won the state championship and had a, a great run of four years. And my assistant coach, uh, he, he introduced me to his sister. When I went to college, uh, a couple of years after I left high school, he we kept in touch and he was a dear friend. And he said, hey, I want you to meet my sister. And I said, Ryan, I've known you six years and been great friends and I didn't know you had a sister. So meanwhile, he was talking to her saying, hey, I want you to meet one of my former basketball players. And and so he introduced us my sophomore year there at Oral Roberts University. She was studying in Springfield, Missouri as a senior. So we met, and then it was just off to the races at that point. My mom came home. Uh, Lisa, my bride, moved to Tulsa after she graduated college. And my mom uh, came home, and she said, have you seen that Wakely girl? And I said, that was her maiden name. I said, yeah. And she said, you better snatch her up quick. She just got to town. She's going to be gone in a second. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yes, ma'am, and, and here we are. Classic Becky, which is exactly. Pastor Daniel's mom. Well, what did Dad think of Lisa? Oh, he thought she was an incredible woman. He thought she came from a great family. She played four years of college volleyball, so she knew how to compete, and I played some college basketball. So he thought we'd have a lot to share in common, and he was all for it. How did you guys decide to move from Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was your home for many, many years, Mm -hmm. and her, I guess, temporary home? Why did you all decide to move to Colorado Springs? Yeah, I I spent my first 22 years in Tulsa. It's the only place I had known. Halfway through my college uh, years when I was 20, 
some friends in Colorado Springs invited me out to intern at this church here at New Life. And so I was out here for the summer for 10 weeks living and working and getting to know the people. And um, I had two years of college left, and the senior pastor at that point pulled me aside after the 10 weeks, and he said, hey, I, I know you have two years of school left, so go back. But if when you're done you feel like the Lord's calling you here, you've got a job. So he had been watching me that summer and paying attention to my contribution and how I built relationships. And so he just said, hey, tuck this in your hip pocket. Uh, you know, you got a job if, if you want it in two years. So when we came to my senior year, Lisa and I got engaged at Christmas, and they flew us out here to Colorado Springs and said, hey, you know, here's the church, and if you come, uh, here's what we want you to do. And, and Lisa interviewed as a school teacher. She was teaching in Tulsa and they offered her a job. So we had two job offers uh, six months before I graduated college. I graduated. We got married a couple weeks later. And in that time of, you know, that last semester, we were just praying, seeking the Lord, talking to my parents, talking to Lisa's parents, uh, interacting with the other sages in my life who knew me. And, and we really just discerned God's green light is yes, that he was sending us to Colorado Springs. So I called the church back and said, see you in July. So we got married July 1 and moved out here July 14th. Pastor Daniel, in your book, you uh, wrote that Lisa and you started in an apartment. And I don't know if you know this or not, but I, David Warren, am a longtime apartment dweller even today. And I like how you say that a place can only become a home if you will do the work of treating it like home. So how, yeah. did, how did Lisa and you approach that starting out in an apartment? Well, we got settled uh, the first week or two, and then her parents drove back to Tulsa. And it was just the two of us. And, uh, you know, we had a one-year lease, and I was thinking of this apartment as just a, a, a stopping ground. I'm passing through. This is someone else's place. You know, we got a decent rate on it, but but this isn't going to be home. And when Lisa's parents left, Lisa got out the tape measure and started measuring the walls and looking around. Where should we hang pictures? Okay, what do we need? We need a carpet over here. She goes to Lowe's and starts buying plants. And, and I just, it was like a force of nature. I watched this woman transform this little bitty one-year leased apartment into a beautiful place. And I said, Lisa, why are you doing that? We're, you know, this is someone else's place and we're not going to be here long term. And she said, Daniel, we're going to have our family here. We're going to host our friends here. I'm going to invite students from the school over here. We're going to feed them dinner. We're not going to mail it in for the next year. This is going to be our home and we're going to make it a home. And I watched her snap that thing to attention and it was gorgeous. And I found that when I would come home from work, I could relax. I could take a deep breath. I settled in and I was under the impression that if I didn't own it, I wasn't going to treat it right. (laughs) I wasn't going to beautify it. And Lisa said, no, this is where we are. And wherever we are, we're going to make a home. And it really taught me a lesson about really loving the place that you are at, even if it's not the place you're going to be at long term. Well, I'm on Team Becky when it comes to your wife, Lisa. (laughs) Exactly. You write on page 137, Home is not just a roof over our heads, though that is a great gift in itself. Home is a haven from which we rise rested to launch out into the world with God's blessing. And it is the place we run back to so as to recover after a good day's work. Mm -hmm. It is the place where memories are made and futures are formed. It is the place where imaginations are sparked and lifelong relationships are solidified. It is the place we learn to pray, and it should be the place where it's safe to weep. So, do your best to make your household holy ground. Hang pictures on the walls. Paint it with colors that bring you joy. Work to create order and orderliness. You may be in a college dorm. You may be renting a room in someone's basement. You may be holed up in a cramped apartment that you hope is temporary. Wherever you are, find ways to make it yours for the time you're there. Back on part one, Pastor Daniel, we talked about your Colorado ranch that you share with two other families. Tell us about your ranch house and how you've made it home for Daniel and Lisa and the rest of the Grothies. 
Yeah. So, yeah, we live out on land, and um, we've got animals out here, cattle and pigs, and we just had a fresh set of piglets uh, two weeks ago. And So we're we're working hard and getting our kids out and their hands in the soil and all that. But the home, we, we actually, when we built this place, we downsized it quite a bit because in our previous place, we... We had more space, and we realized we didn't need that much, and actually sometimes it kept us away from each other. <laughs> and I think that's one of the funny little accidents of the last 30 or 40 years of American life for people who can do it. We we have homes that actually keep us spaced out from each other. And so we wanted to shrink the house quite a bit, and we did it intentionally. And uh, so my only request was that I have a study. <laughs> A library, a place to go write and read and pray and kind of shut the door. Um, so that was my one request, and the rest of it was Lisa's doing. So she helped us, uh, you know, plan it. But we built it where we can walk next door to my sister's house and brother-in-law's house and their four kids. And last night we got home from work, and we were out walking and checking on the animals, and I bumped into my brother-in-law and stood there and talked for 30 minutes. And then we walked to our other neighbor's house and went in and sat down and he got out some sparkling water and we sat down and chatted for 30 minutes. And so we're trying to build a life and, and four years into this place, we've, we've really received the gift of a community of people around us. And that's what we hoped for. That's why we were going out to the land. And now we're four years later, last night I, I looked out and my brother-in-law, after I walked away from talking to him, saddled up two horses and he jumped on one, and my little boy, Wakely, who's 10, jumped on the other horse. And they rode for an hour together, you know, till sunset. So I don't know. It's not a perfect setup, and other people might think, gosh, you're trying to create this idyllic express. All I know is I want social capital for my kids. I want my kids having the chance to put their hands in the soil. And as I said in the first episode, our rule with our kids is you have to earn your dinner, <laughs> you have to earn your shower, and you have to earn your sleep. So come in hungry, come in dirty, come in tired. And most days we're seeing that happen. I love it. I'm David Warren talking with author Daniel Grothy about The Power of Place. That is his latest book with Thomas Nelson, available wherever books are sold. Plus, if you enjoyed hearing Daniel read a little earlier, you can hear him read the whole book on audible.com. When we come back, we're going to talk about stability in family. Back after this. I'm David Warren here with some exciting news for Oasis listeners. We have a new mobile device app. It's free, easy to download, and lets you enjoy our refreshing music and talk everywhere you go. If you have an Android cell phone, go to the Google Play Store. And if you have an iPhone or iPad, visit the Apple Store and search for Oasis Radio Network. Be an Oasis ambassador and share this news with family and friends around the world. There's food for the hungry, joy for the sad. I found an oasis of love. Oasis Network. The name of the book we're talking about today is The Power of Place by Daniel Grothy, and the subtitle is Choosing Stability in a Rootless Age. And Chapter 9 of the book starts with this sentence. As long as everything's okay at 10705 South 85th East Avenue, nothing else really matters. Pastor Daniel, what's the origin of that sentence? My parents were in a a difficult season of work and ministry at that particular point, and they just tucked us kids in bed. I have three sisters, and so we were all young and you know, parents at the end of a day with four kids are just exhausted. So they they tucked us in bed and prayed blessing over us and then went out to the living room and started talking about the the difficult season they were in. And mom just kind of collapsed onto the couch crying. And my dad went over. My dad is 6'6". Six, six, my mom's 5'2". You know, so he's a big guy. And he goes and sits down on the couch and picks my mom up and puts her on his lap and he's holding her. She's crying. And my dad says, Becky, as long as everything's okay at 10705 South 85th East Avenue, nothing else really matters. 
So that obviously that wasn't a literal statement. He, he's not trying to shut down the rest of the world and you know insulate and isolate. But what he was saying in that moment is, there's only one thing we can control, and that's being decent to one another, and that's honoring one another, and that's honoring the Lord in this home with these children, and that's the only thing we can control. And if we do that right, God will take care of it. Nothing else matters. So that became really a family rally cry for us. And there would be difficult seasons that would uh, stir up for us as kids. And I'd hear my dad look at us and go, look, guys, the world is complex. We can't control how other people respond. But as long as everything's okay right here, as long as we do it right, as long as we repent and honor the Lord and honor each other, we're going to be okay. So we hold that to to this day. We we still say that to our kids, and we insert our address there. So a great moment for our family. I think of so many people tuned in right now that are thinking to themselves, boy, I wish my family were like yeah. that. But you give us help in your book. You list four postures that can lead to stability in family, and we'll just touch on these. The first is to listen. And boy, what a talent that is and much underused in most families. Yeah. I mean, we were sitting at the dinner table last night and I don't always do well at the dinner table. And none of us do. We, like, we had our three kids. I was exhausted. Uh, we had work to do still at the end of the night. The kids had homework. But trying to carve out a space where everyone can be heard. And so we have a little practice around our dinner table you know, high, we, we say high, low, ha. So what was your high of the day? What was your low of the day? And what was your ha? What made you laugh? And those little prompts, what was the high moment? What was the low moment? And what was the moment that made you laugh? You'd be surprised what conversation that provokes with your people. So learning to listen to each other, creating space, drawing out by asking really good questions, drawing out the depths of the people that you love, we live in a world that is isolating and lonely, and we can be strangers in the midst of a big crowd of people. But if we have a small community, and you don't have to have a big family, you don't have to be married to do this, but to have friends, to have uh, comrades, to have an auntie or an uncle or a sister or a brother who can ask you and check up on you, how are you doing, what do you need? If we can learn to listen to each other, I think we'll be fine. Another posture that leads to stability in family is to learn from each other. You write, become a student of your most important people. So give us an example of how you have become a student of Lisa. Yeah, well, that is the task of of marriage. What is it that she loves? What is it that uh, gives her joy? What is it that breaks her heart? What is it that scares her? What does she hope for? I realized when we moved out here away from her parents, you know, we left all of our family. My parents were in Tulsa at the time and her parents, and it was just the two of us coming out. And while we were excited about the days ahead and the future coming, we were also heartbroken to leave our people. And I realized in that time just how much of a connection Lisa has with her parents. So I learned in that season of studying her early on that at least twice a year and sometimes three times a year, even if it's two or three days, I needed to get Lisa back to Tulsa to be with her parents. So a Southwest flight from Denver to Tulsa, boom, best money I would spend. She'd go spend two or three days and reconnect, and then we would take a summer trip. So if I had not paid attention, I would have lost the chance to be a blessing to her, and Lisa would have been longing for something that I could have easily taken care of. So that's just one little micro example of how we learn what each of the great people in our life needs. And if we'll pay attention to that, we'll be able to make the right decisions to get them in good spots to flourish. Jumping ahead to the fourth posture of four that lead to stability in family, love. Make the simple commitment to love your people until death, because these are the people God gave you and God gave you to them. Yeah. And the third posture is called leverage. And you write, give them the very best of your giftings. And when I read that, it reminded me of a Dave and Becky Grothy story, your parents. Mm -hmm. And your parents have counseled many couples um, through troubled times. 
I know that's what they do there at New Life. I know that's what they uh, did when they were here in Tulsa. And I distinctly remember your mom telling a story one time of uh, your dad and she were sitting with this couple and uh, the husband was complaining that the wife didn't respect him and the wife was complaining. <laughs> you know where this is going. <laughs> and the wife was complaining that, you know, he wasn't very nice to her. Yeah. And then the husband said, well, I'm nice all day. When I get home, I'm worn out. And uh, your mom said, if all you have is a little bit of nice in you, save it for your family. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. Do not give your best people the leftovers and do not be. And this is why I think a lot of young kids who've grown up in the church, and this is just a moment for us to reflect. A lot of young people who have grown up in the church sadly have left. And sometimes you listen to their stories and it's because their parents were one way on Sunday among the people of God. And then Monday through Saturday, a different kind of experience. And let's try to be consistent. Let's try to live lives of integrity. And integrity, that word, just comes from integer, which is one or whole. Let's be a whole person, consistent. And, yeah, I, I, I don't want to be Pastor Daniel with the people and a terror with my kids. And so let's leverage the best of what we have for our people. And with that, David, another dimension to the leveraging is – I can't do everything, but there are a few things that I do really well, and I want to use that for the good of my kids. And Lisa, my bride, is a, a great businesswoman and a real estate broker. And I've watched my daughter, who's about to be 15 next week, watch her mom for all of her life negotiate and work deals and make it happen. And now Lillian has this entrepreneurial gift. She's selling puppies and taking chances and building this small little business that at 15 years old is working for her. And it's because Lisa leveraged the giftings that God had given her for the good of her daughter. And her daughter has been practicing those gifts and it's been successful. So parents, you won't be able to do everything. None of us are superheroes, but what are the few things that God has marked you to do? The graces he's given you, the anointing that's on your life Give your kids access to that and allow them to begin to practice their way into it and see where it goes. Beautiful. Pastor Daniel, as we get ready to go to break, if you would, read us to break from your book. Not many realize that marriage is one of the great pillars, one of the true institutions of a decent society. Yes, the union established by God in the beginning is meant to hold things together in a fractured world. So if you find yourself married, Remember that these walls are not meant to be the walls of a prison yard, but of a playground. So live it up. Receive the gift in holy wonder. Hold hands with your spouse and pray. Repent regularly. Forgive each other quickly. Make eye contact in a depersonalizing world. When the lies come to you that greater joy can be found elsewhere, rebuke them. You can be an agent of stability, a practicing member in the sustaining of the world. But all of us, whether or not we're married, come from a family. We have people with whom we can practice stability. We have people for whom we can leverage our strength. We have people with whom we can share and receive love. We all have people we can listen to and learn about. And when we are swept up in the madness of the world, we remember the words of Toni Morrison's dad. Listen, you don't have to live there at work. You live here with your people. Go to work, get your money, and come on home. We'll be back after this. I'm Karen Jensen Salisbury, one of the hosts you hear on the Oasis Network Roadshow. For 35 years, this one hour of the day has inspired and motivated you, our listeners, with thousands of stories of people whose lives demonstrate the truth that with God, all things are possible. It's an hour that you should make a part of your day, Monday through Friday, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Central. The Roadshow, an Oasis Network presentation. The name of the book we're talking about today is The Power of Place, out on Thomas Nelson Books by author Daniel Grothy, available wherever books are sold. The Audible version or audio version is available on the website audible.com. Just look for The Power of Place 
by Daniel Grothy. I'm David Warren, your host today, and I want to read just a little bit from the inside of the book. Daniel Grothy is the Associate Senior Pastor at New Life Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Daniel and his wife Lisa live on what's called a hobby farm, that ranch we talked about, outside of Colorado Springs with their three children, Lillian, Wilson, and Wakely, plus a thriving throng of happy animals. And we talked a little bit more in depth back in part one. This is part two. So when this ends today, why don't you go back, treat yourself, and listen to the archive of part one with Daniel Grothy on the power of place. It's found in the Roadshow section of our website, oasisnetwork.org, oasisnetwork.org. Well, each chapter of Pastor Daniel's book starts with a quote, and here's one regarding friendship. I love this. Adult friendship is two people saying, I haven't seen you in forever. We should really hang out more over and over again until one of you dies. <laughs> Boy, that's the truth. <laughs> oh, that's what good comedians can do. Comedians have the ability to make us laugh and also make us go, oh, shoot. It, it sort of peels back a layer of truth that you had buried. <laughs> So, wow, what a what an indictment. You tell such great stories in the book, and one that I want to highlight now and have you tell is about your friend who took a job in the bush of Africa, and he was just really going to go change the way things were done over there and just make things better. But he, yeah. he learned a valuable lesson in he the did. process. Tell us about it. He did. So he was going over to help dig wells uh, to get them fresh water. These tribes were suffering from waterborne illnesses. And so he's an engineer. He's highly trained, well paid, crushing it. And he's got a six month stint going to the bush of Africa. So he's got to connect with the tribal chief who's kind of the liaison. And uh, one day in, in kind of broken English, the tribal chief says, tell me about the American man. And and so my friend begins to tell him about the American man that he he works a lot and uh, he's he's away from his home half of the day very often and in the car and commuting and and uh, you know doesn't see his his friends much and so the the African uh, chief says so half of the day he's away from his people and then and then his people have to sleep eight hours of the day so he has what four hours maybe to see his people and. So the American man is kind of going, yeah, but he makes really great money. And so uh, the American man is kind of sort of justifying the way we've chosen to live. And mm -hmm. the African chief says, so you're telling me the American man is lonely. And there was this kind of pause. And my friend who, who came back from that six months in the African bush started really reevaluating his life and how he was living and the routines and how he spent his time and he maybe chose to make a little bit less money to be able to live a richer quality of life. And he said that, that he, he, it took him going to Africa, to the African bush, with these people who have nothing. I mean, when they pray, give us this day our daily bread, they mean it literally. They get up and seek their daily water, and they hope not to get sick. And the elders, though, are with their grandchildren and the the men of the tribe are together all day, and the women are with each other helping prepare food and, and sew up the clothing. And so they don't have much, but this American man, who is a highly trained engineer, said, I realized that they had much more quality of life and much more joy and much more friendship than I do. And he came back and he really changed his life based on what he had learned from this African tribe. I love that story. You mentioned in your book that the first problem identified in the Bible is the problem of loneliness. Yeah. Adam needed a friend. It is not good that man should be alone. And we typically just talk about that with marriage. But I think we need to broaden that out. I think that's overly reductionistic. Of course, that does include marriage. But it is not just for marriage. It is not good for people to be alone. And uh, this is the God who, think about this, God in his very essence, like this is where Christian theology actually matters. When we say God, we, what we mean is God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
which means that God in his very essence, in his own life, is a constant ecstatic celebration of unbroken love, that the Father is always and ever saying over the Son, this is my Son whom I love. And the Son is always responding to the Father saying, into your hands I commit my spirit, and I love you, and I don't want to do anything unless you're doing it, and I don't want to say anything unless you're saying it. And the theologians speak of the Holy Spirit as the the person, the communion of the Father and the Son going out into the world. And so God in his essence is community. He is friendship. And Adam by himself was not enough. And we live in this moment where we think if we're paying our bills, we have what we need. If we do have a roof over our head, we have what we need. But how many Americans today, how many first world Westerners today have all their bills paid, but they don't have the one thing that actually leads to deep joy? And so I think in this moment in time, especially given the two years of COVID shutdown, we could stand to reclaim the gift of friendship. It is not good for people to be alone. You mentioned three threats of friendship in your book. Let's touch on these, one being blatant individualism. What is, what is that? <laughs> the blatant individualism is that thing in us that says, I'm a self-made person. I, I got this. I'm going to go knock it down. I'm gonna, if I just create my five-year plan, I'm going to get out and get it. And, and I don't really need other people, and people are disposable. People are usable. I, they are for my own ends so that I can get my five-year plan accomplished. We have this individualism thing in us. We're going to go out. Like I live in Colorado, and individualism is deep here. And you trace it back 150, 200 years, we're the Wild West. You know, We're the great frontier. We're the, the Rocky Mountains. And people came here from the east, and they stopped at the Rocky Mountains and thought, shoot, <laughs> you know, how are we? It's dry. It's the high desert. It's 7,000 feet. How are we going to settle out here? But somehow they figured it out. And it still is in the system out here. It's amazing. I've never lived in a place that was more individualistic. Mm. I've got this. I'm going to shut my door. I'm going to close my garage. As long as I have food on my table, I'm good. And the people of God have lived differently. And you read church history. They're the ones creating community. They're the ones going out into the streets to adopt children that have been abandoned in plagues. The people of God, looking at the God of friendship, have chosen to create communities of friendship. And so we've we got to do this. we gotta, we got to reject the blatant individualism. The second threat of friendship, according to your book, is dizzying busyness. So we'll just say, <laughs> look at your schedule and do something about it. That's the short yeah. and sweet version of that. But the third yep. threat to friendship, I want you to tell us about this one our pathological avoidance of conflict. Yeah. When it gets hard, and it will get hard for all of us, I think we think that the easiest play is to run, to find a new community. We live in this cancel culture, unfriend people, uh, ghost people. Like We've created all these different terms to describe the moment we're living in. We don't want to press in and do the hard work. And think about the old small communities that, you know, so much of Americans lived in. Like you had the small town, you had to go, if you had beef with someone, you'd meet them at the breakfast diner and go sit across from them and talk it out. Here's what happened. I don't like what you did out there. This is what I think it takes to make it right. Can we make it right? And over a greasy spoon breakfast, you shake hands and you apologize and you do right by one another. And this is what Scripture tells us to do all the time. If someone has sinned against you, go to them. If you're offended, go to them. Talk to your people. Forgive one another quickly. And in so doing, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Like All of these commands that have been given to us to make things right, we would do well to begin to practice them in this moment. But we have become keyboard warriors. We hide behind our computer screens. We post sarcastic memes on Facebook, and we think we're sticking it to the other side. But it doesn't leave us healed, it doesn't leave us fulfilled, and it leaves us quite lonely. So the face-to-face -face conversation, telling someone how you feel and how their actions made you feel, 
and then finding a way to, to come back together. I think it's the hardest work, but I think it's the most meaningful work, and it means you'll show up with 30- and 40-year friends at the end of your life. I'm going to tell on myself here, I this is many years ago, Pastor Daniel. I had <laughs> acted in an unbecoming way. Actually, it was toward your father, uh. David Grothy. And he's so... <laughs> I was not going to go there with this. Um, so kindly address that issue. Mm. And we're good friends today. Absolutely. And so, that's where, that's the true stuff, David Warren. Like, if you want to have friendship and deep intimacy, and if you want to have history with people, it's going to take those conversations. And that's just normal. That's life. That. It happens. But now our current move when those things happen is to ghost and to turn the back and to run and to unfollow and to unfriend. And the thing is, we think we're running away from it and we're going to get away from it. But wherever we go, there we are. <laughs> and that thing just chips away at our heart. And so to me, I think it's the, it's the two of you coming together face to face going, man of God, my bad. And and you hug it out, and you move forward with a deepened relationship. It's it's available to us. Well, you come from good stock. Mm, Bef- I do. I love them. Before we take our final break, I'd like for you, as a longtime pastor, to address stability in church. What what does yeah. that what does that mean to you? Oh man, it's complex. I will say that. There are reasons that people have left. There has been pain. I've experienced pain in church. All of us have. If you've been in the body of Christ, you've experienced pain because guess what? We are human beings. We are frail and we have faults. Um, But I think the church is the place where we can begin to practice the life of the world to come in advance and do what we just talked about. And commit, like the power of place, the book is called Choosing Stability in a Rootless Age. I have people in Colorado Springs that I've known for 17, 18 years that in those 18 years have been to six churches. And we we treat churches today like we treat gyms. You know, the best equipment with the best child care at the lowest cost. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're going to go there. And, oh, the place down the street. Two years later, it's a new building, it's a new whatever, it's it's kind of the, the happening place, and we bounce. But church is different. Church is the community of God where if we'll just, I tell people, if you'll just come and sit in the same place week after week after week, and you'll take a risk and you'll introduce yourself and you'll go out to lunch with someone or have a family over to your place, these are the people that are going to help carry you to your rest. And if God doesn't move you to a new city, try to stay at the same church for the long haul, because these people can watch the highs, they can watch you baptize kids, or they can help you bury your parents, or they can help pray over you when you're sick. And I say, I, I, I told a guy recently who was, uh, who was leaving, and he just had bounced three different places in five years, and I said, look, one day you're going to need someone to bury you, and are you going to have strangers do that? Mm. Like, have some people that have known you for decades and live in such a way that at that moment, you're going to have people who will be able to stand up and say, I've watched this guy's life. This is a man of God. I bless him and his memory, and I miss him. And something about living together with the saints and watching all of life unfold, the highs and the lows, and to have a community who can carry you through that, to me, that makes you richer than a, a really great spreadsheet or a really great salary. If you have friendship over the long haul with the people of God, you're going to have what you need. We're talking about making the choice to choose stability in a rootless age. That is the subtitle of the new book by Daniel Grothy. Grothy is spelled G R O T H E. The Power of Place is the name of the book, available wherever books are sold. And Pastor Daniel reads the book on audible.com. Again, the name of the book, The Power of Place. We're going to take our final break now. I might even get a Kleenex. And when we come back (laughs) in our final moments, we will talk about the 
Last practice of stability, stability in community. Pastor Daniel and David Warren here will be back after this. I'm David Warren, Program Director at Oasis Radio Network and one of the hosts of this podcast. All of our hosts enjoy hearing from you, our listening family, so drop us a note. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and you'll receive new episodes on your mobile devices. And now, back to the show. Oh, what a program we have had today. This is part two of our two-part series on the power of place with pastor and author Daniel Grothy. Again, take advantage of listening to part one after this program is over. Um, It is in the archived roadshow section of our website, oasisnetwork.org. And by the way, today's guest's website is danielgrothy.com. Reach out to him also and tell him that you enjoyed this series danielgrothy.com, D-A-N-I-E-L-G-R-O-T-H-E dot com. Pastor Daniel, as we wrap up this series, let's talk about stability in community. In chapter 12, you give us two guiding images or metaphors to hold on to that can help us live well Mm -hmm. in our particular places. And the first metaphor is Imagine the place in which you live as a garden and you as the gardener. Tell us your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, the the biblical imagery of garden is everywhere, starting on the first page down to the end. And uh, gardeners pay attention. Gardeners, you don't go out there hacking around. We have a good garden out on our ranch, and what I've realized is There are certain times in the growth where unless you mark it really clearly, you don't know what it's going to be. You planted it months ago, but you've kind of forgotten. So you're going, okay, what is this? And okay, what do I need to do here? Is that a weed or is that life-giving? I need to be patient here. I need to watch. So gardeners are paying attention, and gardeners also realize that it's in different sections of the garden. There are different approaches that are needed. And so with your friends, with your people, with your community. Pay attention. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. Uh, Contextualize the work. Learn the people around you. Understand your neighbors and your neighborhood and the different things that they need from you. And if you'll live as a gardener with that kind of sensitivity, I think you will see fruit grow. And then there is the second of the guiding images or metaphors that will help us live well in our particular places, and that is to imagine the people situated around you as a congregation and you as their pastor. And so to explain this, I would like for Pastor Daniel Grothy to read from his book. There will be children running around your street who need someone to notice them, learn their names, Many of them will live in homes filled with strife and instability. Many of them will not have food in their pantry. A significant part of your pastoral duties will be making cookies for these children and having popsicles in your freezer for hot summer afternoons. Let them know that your lawn is their lawn and your driveway is their driveway. If you live this way, you will re-enchant the neighborhood. Relationships will develop. Trust will rise. If you live this way, they will instinctively know where they'll find kindness and lots of candy on Halloween. And if you live this way, expect to receive lots of graduation announcements and wedding invitations a couple of decades from now. All the neighborhood children you cared for will grow up feeling the strength of their increased social capital. They will know they have you in their corner. They will sense the safety of your presence and their world will be enlarged because of it. When you are old, they will remember you and visit you when they return home for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And when you enter your eternal rest, they will cry at your funeral and honor your memory as they live the life of neighborliness that you taught them. On your street, there will likely be an elderly woman who lives alone and needs to be visited and cared for and listened to. In the years to come, she may need you to drive her to a medical appointment. Let her know in advance that when that time comes, She doesn't need to look any farther for help. You would be happy to be her chauffeur. 
Take another neighbor with you when you visit her so the web of relationships can be broadened and the community can function more fully as a family unit. Remember, you are the pastor of your street and your neighbors are your parishioners. What I have found is that often there is a direct correlation between one's service to a community and one's stability within it. To the degree that you build others up in your local place is the degree that your roots go down. To the degree that you create stability for others is the degree to which you will experience stability yourself. For as the prophet Isaiah said, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. and He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. And you will be called repairer of the broken walls, restorer of streets with dwelling. Wow. Congratulations once again on this newest book, The Power of Place. By Daniel Grothy, and of course he has the other book out, Chasing Wisdom, both on Thomas Nelson Publishers, available wherever books are sold. Daniel Grothy, G-R-O-T-H-E is how you spell his name. And if you enjoy listening to Daniel read his book, like we've had him do on parts one and two, then you would enjoy the audiobook found on audible.com. And what I enjoyed about this second or newer book, The Power of Place, is that you read it on yes. Audible. Did you enjoy the process? I loved it. It was three hard days. I, I wouldn't have thought it would have been that difficult, but I was exhausted afterwards. My voice lost it, but it was so great to be able to read it because you write it and you know what you want it to sound like. So you get to represent it and intone it the way that you want. So it was a delight. And David Warren, you're a brilliant interviewer. I always love coming on the road show. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being with us. I have such love and admiration for you and the entire Grothy family. Come back and visit us soon and write more books. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We'll do. <laughs> for Pastor Daniel Grothy, I'm David Warren, and it's been... Another great roadshow. You've been listening to The Roadshow. If you'd like to write to us, here's our address. The Roadshow, P.O. Box 1924, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74101. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. The views of today's guest aren't necessarily those of this station, but we do appreciate and thank our guest for spending this time with us. The Roadshow, an Oasis Network presentation.